am looking, Ernie, at the uh, screen. And, you know, we're going to post these images on Facebook. Right. But uh, David Bowie with very long hair. Yeah. That is quite a picture of him. And you did some work on Sirius Moonlight. You no, know, it's really funny because, uh, and I think I mentioned before in one of the other uh, interviews that we did, or one of the shows we did, uh, the uh, Haji Sound that was a mobile, one of the early mobile sound recording studios uh, that uh, these guys right next door to us in the crossroads of the world, which is a landmark on Sunset Boulevard there between La Brea and Wilcox. Uh, and we had, uh, we had had rented, um, we had first rented Mel Brooks's first recording studio. And then we, we, as we grew, we needed a bigger space. So we, we got this space that looked like a pagoda shaped something from India. In fact, if you go to the uh, Muscle of Love album for Alice Cooper, you'll see the front of our, our building here in the crossroads because we painted it up to look like a mud wrestling place. But it was a great place and we loved the crossroads we were in there for about nine ten years and next door to us uh was these guys that had a mobile that were building a mobile recording studio it was called haji sound and um uh, we were there at pacific Pioneer, and this is like uh, i don't know 1972 we had already been in business for about six months eight months and we had moved to the bigger space and uh david bowie uh, was at Haji Sound looking at their facility, this mobile recording. It was beautiful, it was a huge thing. So he was there, and I, you know, and I, I, I didn't really know who David Bowie was. You know, I mean, I kind of had heard the name here and there. I wasn't familiar with the music, you know, and didn't really, really get into him until after we had met him. And, you know, Ziggy Stardust, you know, was like huge. And every cut on that album was amazing. But, and I always, you know, like the fact that I had met him. And, and I took this picture of him when he was at the studio at Pacific Pioneer. We were next door and he, I guess, had heard of us and maybe seen a couple things that we did for Alice or whatever, but he, you know, the guys at Haji Sound, they got talking and they, you know, they actually used us in their advertising. Now we're right next door to Pacific Pioneer because we were pretty well known by 70, you know, by the, well, not so long even after the, uh, beginning of Pacific Pioneer because we had a track record before we started Pacific Pioneer. We were pretty well known. And these guys at Haji Sound were really kind of good to be next door to us because we were in kind of the same business. We both attracted the same kind of, you know, person, musicians and, and groups and stuff. So, you know, they had talked, uh, they were talking and, and they said, oh, yeah, I know Pacific Pioneer is right there. So he came over, you know, and, and we hung out for a while and you know, we took this picture of him and then I didn't really hear anything from him again. I mean, we always liked, I always liked the fact that I, that I had met him. I always liked his music. You know, it was a different kind of music because he kind of, he kind of connected a lot of different, he, he connected and influenced a lot of different uh, directions that music was taking at the time. You know, he probably went from, you know, the glam rock thing, you know, over to the plastic soul, you know, and then the new, you know, the new romantic, you know, pop thing, and then into the uh, neoclassic. So he crossed over all those different genres of music. And so he was a real, I mean, you know, Rolling Stone magazine said that he was probably the most influential, you know, artist of the 21st century. Which, you know, was, again, I was a fan. I never got a chance to see him in concert, but, you know, I was always a fan of his music. And, and I, to me, he, to me, he kind of was like the Beatles. The Beatles did kind of the same thing. You know, they transcended some music. They took, you know, from one place to another and then changed the way we heard music and the way we accepted music. And David Bowie did the same thing. He changed the way we listened to music and he changed the way we accepted the music. And he was a really instrumental. One guy, the Beatles were, and I just, you know, I just watched uh, yesterday, I watched A Hard Day's Night and I'd probably seen it 50 times, but for some reason I was in right, the right zone. I was working on a sketch and I, it came on and I was just glued to it. And though, you know, how would you ever imagine that three guitars and a drum would, would change the world? 
And that's what they did. They changed the world. They changed the way we accepted music. They changed the way we listened to music. And, and you know, it's just a sad thing that two of them are gone, you know, but still the two of them are here. And, you know, I mean, it, it's just, it was a very magical time, you know, and I think David Bowie had that same kind of charisma about him, you know, and his music and his fan base. I mean, he sold hundreds of millions of albums. The guy was just incredible, you know, and and so we hadn't heard from him um, in, a, in a long time. So this, we, he came to our office in 1972, and then we didn't hear anything from him again. I mean, we were, I was kind of, as always, you're hoping that they'll go, oh, oh yeah, you know, we need now, let's call Pacific Iron here. But that never really happened. And then in, believe it or not, 1983, okay, I get a call from David Bowie. Whoa. <laughs> and I, and I, you know what? And, and we were always playing tricks on each other in the art department. You know, we go off on another line and call up and pretend you're somebody else through the secretary, you know, and you never notice that the lights are lit, you know, I mean, because it, we had half a dozen lines. And, and so we were always playing tricks on each other. And I, Ernie, this is David Bowie. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Prove to me that you're David Bowie. Okay, because I and I, I was as I was saying that I was looking around to see who was in the art department and who was it, because it was probably somebody from the art department that was <laughs> doing this. Right. And then they'd have this big laugh. Right. And we were constantly doing it to each other. And so I, you know, I'm like, yeah, right. OK, prove to me that you do. And I'm saying that I'm looking around. Everybody's in the art department. OK, so it's not and I know it's not my partner, Tony, because he's out on a sales call. It's not the secretary. So this really must be David Bowie. And, and you know, he's you know, he started in with, you know, well, you remember back in 1972, I came by your studio, you know, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is Dave. This is David Bowie. I, I was like, uh, 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 you know, I. That would have been like, me. Oh. That would have been me too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, being a big fan, you know, I mean, I, and I've said that before. I've always been a fan of the musician, you know, and the group, and and uh, you know, and and I had a diverse um, taste in music, and I think you know that's what really enabled me to do so many different kinds of things. I mean, we've talked about a lot of them on the show. You know, you're going from you know, and we're going to be doing stuff on the Partridge Family and the Brady Bunch all the way up to the Rolling Stones and Alice Cooper and Black Sabbath and, you know, Black Oak, Arkansas. You know, the range is huge. And, you know, Bloodstone, a lot of soul stuff, Save the Children. It, we, were, we were really diverse, you know, in the way we would handle music and the covers because I think part of it was because I was such a big fan. You know, the other guys were fans, but not as big as I was. You know, I was the biggest fan. They were, you know, fans and they were liking the music. And I think I mentioned that I had to talk to Drew for quite a while to do stuff with Alice Cooper and stuff with Black Sabbath because he was very religious. And those two bands were satanic, you know, and, you know, he he liked my work, but he just really didn't like the Rolling Stones, didn't like that tongue logo. He was very opinionated. You know, and still is. I mean, and you know what? You can't begrudge him. He's probably the best illustrator, painter, you name it, that I've ever worked with. And I think one of the he's the most collected illustrator in the world. So it's pretty hard to debate, you know, what his feelings are. But again, we talked about that before. The art department was made up of so many different personalities in different, you know, things and that was part of the reason when we talked about that lost painting that I did for the Rolling Stones. I mean, it, it was, I wanted to reinstate that in each one of us that we were individuals and mm -hmm. we could do stuff on our own without the team. But, you know, it's like the sum being, you know, just parts of the whole, you know, yeah, you can go off and be great over here and you go off and be great over there, but you're never going to be, you know, back working with that core group again. I mean, which was kind of sad, but everybody kind of moved on and, and didn't move down, moved up. So it's like, if, if we were a band, each one of the members of that band went off to other bands that became greater, and especially Drew. I mean, Drew is like the Rolling Stones. I mean, he, he is so well known and he has, a, he has a show right now in Lyon, France with his movie posters and stuff. So the guy is just an amazing talent. You know, and, and so when we heard again from David Bowie, now, so now this is, um, this is 1983, 
and he was, you know, he was already doing this, um, you know, the, the tour, you know, that the, the, uh, the serious moonlight tour and uh, let's dance was the big single that was from that tour. And um, so he, he was doing that tour and he was getting ready to do a, uh, a video, a, a doc, not a documentary, a video of the of the concert, and it was going to be called Serious Moonlight, and he was talking to me about an Asian feel that he was doing in that show. And when you look at the video, I mean, they're wearing Asian hats, and you know, I mean, it's it's really they're all kind of into that motif of you know uh, going with the theme of this Asian kind of. Thing. And, and he had seen a couple things that I guess people had presented to him, but he didn't like. And he always remembered us. You know, he said, I, I, I'm still a fan, you know, and I, I love the lettering that you do. OK, now, by this time, I've done quite a few logos, including the Bee Gees and Black Sabbath and all these different palettes. And um, each one of those groups that we did those logos for that had lasted were kind of individuals in that category that really kind of set the pace for it. There were a lot of them that were imitated. If you look at David Lee Roth from uh, Van Halen, you know, he took the look of Jim Dandy from Black Oak, Arkansas, you know, with the spandex pants and all white and the long blonde hair. I mean, the only thing he David didn't have was a scrub board around his neck. That's what I was thinking. I didn't see the scrub board there, Van Halen. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sand scrub board. You know, but I mean, I'm a big Van Halen, David Lee Roth fan as well. And with Sammy Hager, too. But, you know, David Lee Roth, it's like Alice's group. There are people that love Alice Cooper, the original band, and don't like the new stuff. And will argue that he's never had a hit as big as when the group was together. And there's a lot of, you know, Shep had a lot of... Uh, hesitation about separating Alice from the rest of them. And some of them felt that they were too good to be in the band and wanted to move on and do their own thing and didn't really need Alice. So there was a lot of different directions that everybody was pulling in, which have, look at the Beatles, you know, I mean, that's one of the things that makes the Rolling Stones so great is that they never really did that. They off, went off and did their own stuff, but they always came back. They always came back to that core and they're still doing it to this day. You know, and God bless, you know, uh, uh, oh, damn, now I've got this brain. <laughs> Charlie Watts. God bless Charlie Watts, man. I mean, uh, and the, the new guy is great, you know, and has been with them for a long time. It isn't like a new guy, but it's not Charlie Watts. You know, Alice Cooper, even though they're the group without GB, you know, they're really not the same. You know, so I mean, and, and so anyway, David Bowie had always been, even though he was early on, he was connected with some other bands in England. You know, he really launched as a solo artist and really kind of kept that, kept that integrity, did some things with Mick Jagger or Let's Spend the Night Together and, and some of that other stuff. But, you know, he was always an entity on his own, you know, kind of like Kenny Rankin. Kenny Rankin was never with a band. He was always a solo artist. You know, and there are some people that can do that. You know, I mean, others come, you know, work their way up through other, you know, other associations with musicians. So anyway, sorry to sort of diverse here. But so David wanted an Asian feel. And I spent on, I, on the phone with him. I spent probably, I don't know, I'd say six or seven minutes, which, you know, to me was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'll never forget this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, you know, it, it, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way. I would not even remember half of what was said. So I, I applaud you there. Yeah, right. Well, you know, it, it's really funny because even at 78, I have a pretty good uh, imagine, not imagine, well, imagination and, you know, uh, retaining a lot of stuff because I lived it. I lived it every day. And, and that's why it's so important for me to work with you on the block party to be able to get some of these stories out there because once you're gone, you're gone and those things go with you. You know, if you don't have a way, and that's one of the great things about the internet. That's one of the beautiful things about the block party and you and your value that you bring to everything that I do. I mean, you 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 add the piece that's missing, you know, in my opinion. So, you know, uh, it was really amazing to work on this logo for him. And I didn't talk to him after I did this logo. And you can see it. I, I got a, an Asian feel to it. And the Sirius Moonlight logo or lettering is down there. And again, I'll send you these so you can blow them up. 
And then um, this is how it was used. It was a, 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 a TV movie of the tour called Serious Moonlight. And this is the logo that I did for him. And I didn't, and, and then I didn't hear anything more. I submitted it and then I didn't hear anything. And then all of a sudden there's this TV show that's out there and my logo's in the beginning of it. I mean, and it's really great how they used it. Oh, and I reached out to the people that I had given and I think they were his people, you know, or they may be people that were with the video, with the show, with the network or whatever, but they said that he really loved the logo. And he really, really loved how it came out. So it was like, to me, are you kidding? This is, this is to me, right up there with the Rolling Stones tongue. It's right up there with, you know, Alice Cooper stuff, the Bee Gees. It's one of those logos. I mean, it, 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 if you just look at it, I mean, it, it looks like a Japanese character, the overall look of that David Bowie lettering. I, and I, and, and I, I'm sure he picked up on that because he was a designer as well. He was a designer and a, you know, uh, an artist himself and actually went to art school for a while. And, and a lot of them did, you know, especially the, 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 uh, the bands from San Francisco and stuff. A lot of those musicians and stuff were in art school and, you know, they, they preferred, cause I remember there were uh, a lot of people that I went to college with that played instruments, you know, and not only when they were stoned on acid, they were playing instruments, you know, and making music. And that was all part of it. Uh, of that scene in the 60s but uh, a lot of them went on to do other stuff you know which was really great and you know I, I said that I went to a junior high school and high school with that I never lost, lost touch with a kid named Jimmy Calhoun who played with Dr. John he was a bass player with him years later we reconnected he was in a group called Creation which is a group that one of these times I sent you that list Oh, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and Creation is one of those bands. I don't know whether I put it on there or not, but there's a great story to that, too. And Lenny Lee uh, was the lead singer. We all went to junior high school together. And a guy named Willie Scott, who was a local band, Willie Scott and the Velveteens. And they played all the high school gigs. And, you know, the, and this is like 1956, 1957, you know, when there were still dinosaurs on the on the face of the earth. You know, they hadn't just become oil yet, you know. But uh, uh, so, you know, it was really great to hear from him again, be able to talk to him in person. I mean, I, I wish that I would have had an opportunity to do that with the Stones. You know, I mean, I, I really felt that, you know, and I, and I had a couple of fans on Facebook reach out to me and say, hey, have you have you been to the, the Rolling Stones merch site lately? Because the stuff that they're doing is really terrible. You should really reach out to them. And, you know, and I'm like, now, you know, that what happens there is the Stones aren't really doing it. They have people that do it for them and they contract it out. Yeah. You know, uh, Alice works the same way. She contracts the merchandising out every year. It comes up for whoever wants to bid the highest on it. And smart, you know, I mean, Shep is a very smart business guy and he's a really great piece for Alice because Alice is an artist. Alice, I mean, who else at his age can knock out albums, go on tour with three different bands? You know, I mean, you know, he's right up there with the Rolling Stones, as far as I'm concerned. Some of the major bands from that era came and went, you know, and they come back every once in a while. But, you know, these guys are constantly, if they're not working on an album, they're on a tour, you know, and uh, they take very little time off. And I think it's because I know why it is from the management standpoint. It's about getting the money. Okay. Mm -hmm. Shep told me that once that he said that, that I learned three things from the music business when I started. It. Always ask for the money. Second, never forget to ask for the money. And third, always remember to never forget to ask for the money. Okay. So that's the management standpoint. The artist standpoint is quite clear. Uh, he's just wanting to create. He's wanting to leave a legacy that's bigger. I mean, I'm the same way. I've done thousands of things. You know, to me, it's important that people know that that stuff was out there. I mean, most people wouldn't even know that I did this for David Bowie, but they know who David Bowie is. And thank God for you and the block party that I'm able to tell this story so that now maybe the next time they watch that video or they hear the name David Bowie, oh, I saw this guy 
who had met him early on when he had long hair and didn't look like David Bowie. Uh, and, you know, and now he, you know, he's done all this other stuff right away. They go to the stones and, you know, all the current stuff, but it's always nice to have, you know, and even though it wasn't a major album cover, you know, um, it didn't matter because it was for him. And when we got together that first time, it was really great. I mean, we were meeting, we had a lot of artists that would come to the office. You know, I talked about Mary Travis, Alice was always there. There were a lot of different, you know, Dion was there, you know, all these different people. Uh, and we never did anything for Dion either, but he got a t-shirt. He got a Pacific Islander t-shirt. Oh, that would have been something. Oh my, cause he's, uh, he's still performing. God yes. bless him. Yes. One thing I want to compliment you, Ernie, when we talk about the artists, and I think this is where your success has come in, that you really uh, key in on that artist. Because when you were mentioning David Bowie, Scott Walker of the Walker Brothers, the Walker Brothers were actually bigger in England than they were here in the States. Mm -hmm. And David always admired Scott Walker. Yeah. And the two of them, they had a chance to talk. And uh, Scott one time wished David a very happy birthday. And he said to him, you really freed up a lot of artists and you always embrace the new. David was so moved, he started crying. Because really? to him, Scott was a hero. So you, yeah. you recognize that and it came through in your artwork for David. Well, thank you. You know, I, I've had that experience a couple times. We talked about it, Lou Reed. When we did the Berlin album, you know, we had worked with him. He had seen some stuff, sketches and things. But when my partner, Tony, took, he was in a recording studio in New York. He took the actual printed, constructed piece to show him. David picked up the phone and called me. You know, I mean, David, I'm sorry, Lou, Lou. picked up the phone <laughs> and called me and started crying. Because he said, you know, because he had lived that Berlin experience, that, that triangle between him, another guy, and a girl. And it was very, very personal to him. And he didn't really care whether there was a hit or not. Sweet Jane was on there. I mean, in Berlin, I mean, it was a very down album, you know, mm -hmm. and it wasn't Walk on the Wild Side, where the colored girls go do to do to do. And that's what people wanted to hear. And, you know, I mean, that was probably the biggest hit, you know, outside of maybe Sweet Jane or a couple of those other ones that Lou ever had. You know, it's like, they don't, Lou didn't really care about hit singles. You know, they were like that Grateful Dead. They didn't really care about hit singles. They, you know, they'd have a concert and you know, half a million people would show up. You know, Lou had a similar kind of following, hardcore following. And David Bowie was much like that, you know. And, and you know, I mean, it, it, it was just really, it was an honor for me to meet him. It was an honor for me to say I did this for him and that I heard that he loved it. And I'm sure if he wouldn't have loved it, it would have never made it as far as being the title in the, in the video. That's very so, true. Yeah. So, I mean, that was kind of, you know, and again, I, I don't, you know, I, I think he got pretty ill after that. You know, I mean, it was, uh, he cut back. I think he had a stroke or something, heart attack or something. And then he cut back on the tours and stuff that he did and interviews that he did. And, you know, I mean, it's so funny that adage about the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long that really holds true to the entertainment business, movie stars, you know, and maybe it's, and I don't think it's just because I'm getting old. <laughs> I just think that they live a hard life, you know, and, and Alice is another one of those trendsetters that just really is able to maintain. And for me, I mean, and he, and he's unlike some musicians and some people that would try and look, you know, younger and get facelifts and all that stuff. Alice doesn't care. You know, Alice doesn't care. And, the, and and he, you know, he shows the scars of his trade. It's not easy being a rock star. It really isn't. It isn't easy being any kind of a celebrity. You know? no. It's tough. And, I, you know, as a fan, I respect it. As a human being, I, you know, sometimes I envy it. But it's like, be careful what you wish for. And, I, you know, I, in my own little way, I've, I've made a mark. And that's all that really matters. You know, I've made a mark and, and uh, we're able to talk about it. And that really is. And you, you did, you keyed, you keyed right there into the vision. And the thing that's even, you know, more admirable being a fan, sometimes, you know, you get giddy, but you manage yeah. to keep that in perspective in during your creations. And, yeah, well, and because I had, I'd met a lot of them. I mean, being, being a big fan, I mean, I'm always going to be, you know, I mean, in, in awe of it. 
But as you do it more and more, it becomes more natural. It's like a musician learning how to play guitar or playing an instrument, piano. You know, Burton and I have had that talk about playing the piano and how he's self-taught. You know, he's self-taught and he, and he wasn't really good until he became the best. You know, and he's an incredible singer and songwriter and, and pianist and he plays the flute, and he plays the drums, he plays all the guitar. You know, I mean, those kind of people really blow me away and, and uh, I'm still in awe of that kind of stuff and, and, and hold those relationships and experience here close to the heart, you know, and thank God for you, you know, that are willing to let me ramble on about, it, you know, and I thank you so much for that. Oh, you're not rambling on. I, I, I can relate. I, and I learned something in that too. Well, you know what my next question is. Uh, let me see. I, uh, I feel something is going what's on. What's my, my favorite brain. color? <laughs> yeah, 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 that too. Well, purple is my favorite color. Always has. Been. Good choice. And uh, a song, you know, again, Low Hanging Fruit, you know, uh, Let's Dance, for me, was an amazing song and should be great for this. The other choice that I would have would be my all-time favorite, Ziggy Stardust and the, and the Spiders from Mars. But Let's Dance would be the song because it's so up and it's so needed right now. It's it's a toe tapper. And hopefully when you play it, you know, people will get up off the couch or get out of bed. You know, I know Snowy's always going <laughs> <laughs> you know, our way through the, I mean, God bless her. She's just great. I mean, she's, she's a awesome. sweetie. <laughs> and, you know, it's so funny because we all met a lot of your audience. We had met when I was doing stuff with Burton. We'd get on and do a show for like three or four hours, you know, and she was always one of those hardcore. There was a half a dozen, Linda McFadden. There was a half a dozen of them, you know, that were always there. And, and uh, now they're here at your show, you know, and we're there before I got there and, and some that I brought, which is really great. Uh, you know, the, the neighbors are really very kind and very well hearted. Joseph is one of them that I know, you know, and he it's is real sweet. hardcore, you know, and I appreciate all of that. And I appreciate all of them. And, you know, I, um, all I can say is well, you've got the list, add creation to it. Okay, and let's go from there. It's your, it's tag, you're it. You, uh, you got it, Ernie. And you know, Burton's going to get me too. If he is watching this video, Burton, I love you and I'm so, so sorry, but I'm going to pick some low hanging fruit too. There you go. Because fruit Good. can be healthy. I like uh, golden years when David yes. sings that. It, it's a bit of nostalgia, and he just, like, I think he brings a savoir faire to that. Yes. And, and, you know, and he does, he, and again, it's like what we were talking about, how he's able to bring on these new, I mean, some bands, I remember when punk came out and the Stones tried to do a punk thing and it didn't really work. They wanted, the fans wanted to hear rock and roll. They didn't want to hear punk. If they want to hear punk, they go over to, you know, uh, uh, Sex Pistols or somebody like that, Black Flag, you know, uh, who I, both groups are a big fan of, but, but, you know, they, people want you to be what you what they see in their hearts and their eyes. Now, mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, I think that the Stones never had to this day hits as big as they did when they were first, you know, and I guess you could say that about a lot of them, but they get to the point where the music is more important and it doesn't really look for that commercial, you know, because you got the AR guy from the record company going, well, I don't hear a hit. I don't hear a single here, you know, and, and they don't really care, you know, so it's like, they're going to just do their music. And I think as a, as a, and I, I hope you agree that as a person who enjoys a lot of different kinds of music like you and I, you know, you're willing to accept that. You're willing to take it for a transition or a growth that that musician is doing. You know, when I'm hearing Burton play piano and sing, I don't have any problem with hearing him play guitar and sing or just play guitar or just play drums or just play the flute. You know, I don't go, well, where's, you know, well, he's a singer. Why is he doing that? I mean, it's showing there and, and and again it relates back to me and we've talked about this about how i've always considered myself and the, the gang at pacific iron ear a band and you get to the point where you know you're doing these things and as a group but it's also important that you do them as an individual and for me to do that painting that we talked about for me to do comps and things and sketches was so out of the box for me from the tight little tools that I used in black and white India ink to do all this lettering, like what you see behind you here, you know, that's black <laughs> India ink on an illustration board, 
and it's done with these little tools and you know I mean, so and, precise. And, you know to so to, for me to expand outside of that and do sketches do comps do you know stuff like that painting it was so amazing and thank you so much for letting us talk about that and i've had 300 views on that by the way um and growing and you know it, it's really neat for me to show that i'm more than a one-trick pony but you know i always had the idea always had the concept and the direction but to me that's it's never considered to me that's not an art like sitting there and rule working on lettering and stuff or doing a sketch it's not art the concept is just a starting point. It's a stake in the ground for others to influence and change, which is another great thing about Pacific Ironier. Everybody had a say. And a lot of times they would come back to me and go, hey, man, we already did something like that. We can't do that again. And they were right. You know, and that's one of those things that pushes you being surrounded by people that are better than you makes you be greater than you ever thought you could be. And we'll leave it at that because I know we're running out of time. But I'm waiting for you to pick the next one. Oh, I gosh. Thank well, you. you bet. I'm going to, Ernie, we're going to have a lot of conversations. Honey. Oh, man, you got the list. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I went through one box. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you guys. Take Love care. You, See you next Peace. week.